I get my most views from recording rather than live. And in a sense, asynchronous as opposed to synchronous. So let's talk about the War of 1812. We talked about the war being fought over issues like impressment, uh, Native American tax on the frontier, uh, that there were a group of uh, young Turks, if you will, the War Hawks, uh, including um, uh, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, Felix Grundy, and Richard Johnson, who would march into the house um, announcing Canada, Canada, Canada. They wanted Canada. They'd hope to get Canada and Florida out of this deal, and they're going to get neither. Um, and the Americans are somewhat played diplomatically. I mean, they're, they're new at this, so um, it's, it's not surprising that they're amateurish in their diplomacy. So war is declared. And so we said the Americans weren't ready for war. Uh, the National Bank had lapsed. They really didn't have a professional army. Uh, the Navy only had uh, 16 uh, ships, but the Navy will, uh, will have some of its uh, uh, biggest victories for the Americans because they had been used to fighting pirates off the coast of Tripoli. So we're gonna break the, the, the war down into two components. Uh, one is the war in the North because you, you've declared war against Great Britain. Um, so where are you gonna attack them? You, you really can't sail over to England and go, let's invade England. You just don't have the people to do it. And so they thought we're gonna attack Canada. Uh, and so they decided on this three prong attack. And uh, they're all about these three prong attack. This goes on and on and on. But the first one is that they're going to take General William Hall and about 2,000 men and advance into Upper Canada through Fort Detroit. Um, now, uh, Hall's going to lead his forces across the Detroit River, but is quickly repulsed by British forces led by a man named General uh, Brock. But Hall's problem is that he is sickly and senile. Never a good sign for a general or a mayor. Um, and he's also very afraid of the British, and the British know this because the British have spies in Hull's camp. So the British line up as many redcoats as they can and parades them up and down Fort Detroit. Uh, he then announces to, uh, to Hull that he's got thousands of Indians hiding out in the woods. And, and, and once the fighting starts, he said, look, I, I can control my own men, but I, I really can't control the, the, these, these Indians behind me and they'll just slaughter everybody in, in the, um, the fort. So why don't we just avoid all that and avoid the massacre uh, and you just go ahead uh, and surrender right now to us and that'll be that and everybody will live. And Hall, without consulting his senior officers, does exactly that. Uh, he surrenders. There are no thousands of Native American troops in the background. Um, he fires the entire force without a shot. Now, Hull's going to be court-martialed for that, as you can imagine, but uh, they let him off because of his service in the Revolutionary War. Now, the other problem that, that they want to do is with Stephen Van Rensselaer. He would lead a force of the Army and the New York militia along the Niagara River. Uh, he's going to be more aggressive. He has an advanced party of about 600 American troops, and they cross the Niagara River. And they worked their way up onto the bluffs on the Canadian side to occupy what they call Queenstown Heights. Now the stage is set for a major American victory because they've got the high ground, that's Kobe Wan Kenobi. Uh, and all he needs now is the New York militia to come across uh, over to Queenstown Heights and reinforce his men so that he has enough men to fight off the British because he's at the strategic advantage here. Well, heck, uh, the New York militia says, um, no, we're not going to go over there because we're the New York militia. We're not the Canadian militia. We're not going to cross over there and, and get ourselves killed. We're here to guard New York. And so they sort of sit across the river from the New York side uh, and watch Van Rensselaer and his men get defeated. Okay, so far, not so good. Now, the third attack will be General Dearborn. Now, he will leave his army north from Plattsburgh toward Montreal. And this is going to be that old invasion route that they always try to go through Lake Champlain. Um, so they make their way up toward uh, Canada through Lake Champlain. He marched up to the, the border. And then once again, he's got the New England militia. And they say, we're sorry, 
we are not crossing. We're the New England militia. We guard New England. We don't go into foreign uh, uh, countries and therefore we've got to turn around and go back. Now, as you can imagine early on, this is one of the signs that, that maybe relying on militias, right? And Minutemen wasn't the way to go. And the thought is maybe, just maybe we're gonna need a professional army in the future. Now, so far, not so good. I mean, American doesn't have, an, doesn't have a successful offensive war until the Mexican-American War, but they could do something else. And that's control the inland uh, waterways, the Great Lakes. Um, and so Madison's Navy secretary said, look, uh, he tells a 28 year old Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry, already, by the way, a 14 year veteran of the Navy who'd seen an action in, in, in Tripoli. Imagine, that. think about that. Um, you see action in Tripoli, you're 14, and now you're a Commodore at 28. And by the way, my dad's uh, father's name was Commodore Perry Johnson. So maybe a connection with 1812, maybe. Uh, my middle name is Perry, oddly enough. Um, and so uh, Perry builds ships out of green timbers. And so soon he's out on Lake Erie looking for the British. And he finds them in uh, a place called uh, Put-in Bay, not Putin Bay, stop it Russians, uh, Put-in Bay. Um, while getting ready for the battle against the British Navy there, he turns to one of his aides and says, look, this is the most important day of my life. It was indeed, that's for sure. Um, his flagship, the Lawrence, is, is pummeled from a long distance. Uh, blood was flowing all over the deck, so the sailors slipped and fell as they wrestled with their cannon. Uh, after about four hours of intense shelling, none of the Lawrence guns uh, were left working, and most of the crew was dead or wounded. Well, for the British, they expect at this point that you should surrender. That's the rules of war, right? We're going to go ahead and surrender. That's the end of this. We're good to go. But um, Perry doesn't do that. Perry, who's wounded himself and lost, lost his, hat, his, his Commodore's hat, uh, has himself rowboated over to another ship, attacks the British, and defeats the British. Um, he finally sends uh, General William Henry Harrison, future president, uh, the long-awaited mes message, famous message, we have met the enemy and they are ours. Now, some of you will remember uh, the old comic strip Pogo uh, parried this message with, we have met the enemy and they are us. Well, they got more good news at the Battle of the, the Thames, October 5th in Canadian territory, east of Detroit, General William Harry Harrison eliminated British power up in Canada uh, and de uh, defeated the Indian leader Tecumseh, which will later begin the so-called curse of Tecumseh we'll talk about later. All right, so let's go down toward the South, um, the war in the South. Creek Indians had to make a decision on who they wanted to side with. They really didn't trust the British, uh, but they really couldn't really side with the Americans. The Americans kept creeping up on their land. They were in a no-win scenario. And so they decided to decide with the British, which will be a mistake. They attacked a place called uh, Fort Mims, Alabama, which is on the Alabama River above Mobile. Hey, we were talking about Mobile today. And they kill half the people in the fort. Just the left half, so everybody else is all right. Wait for the laughter and go. Well, the news of the uh, the massacre at Fort Mims reached Andrew Jackson at his home in, in Nashville. And Jackson, interesting enough, is in bed. Um, he's in bed because he's recovering from a fight uh, with future Senator Thomas Hart Benton. Uh, now, Jackson is a major general of the Tennessee militia. He quickly rounds up 2,000 volunteers and set us on a campaign to utterly crunch the Creeks. And they, he does that at the decisive battle of um, Horseshoe Bend. Uh, he defeats the Creek Indians. He actually, uh, in this defeat of the Creek Indians, adopts a, uh, a Creek uh, Indian child that was left homeless uh, and orphaned uh, after the battle. Uh, and apparently uh, treated him as his own son for the rest of his life. You can read about that at uh, Jackson's home at, uh, in Nashville, the Hermitage. Well, on the same day that that happens, uh, March 27, 1814, Napoleon's empire collapsed. Now, 
um, free to deal with America, the British also decided on a threefold plan of operations in 1814. Uh, now, they've got to do this quickly because the British public is tired of war, they're tired of the taxes, they want this to end. Uh, so they come up with a three-prong uh, attack. First, they would in, um, invade the United States through uh, Niagara and Lake Champlain, uh, Champlain, sorry, the same old place they always try to do. Um, and then they would also uh, try to uh, enable blockade of New England. Now, this isn't going to work early on. Uh, the, the British are defeated at Lake Champlain, and that prong doesn't, uh, doesn't work at all. But their other part of this is that they're going to invade um, through the lake, to, to, through Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and which they do. And this is going to lead to one of the most humiliating defeats of the war. Uh, the British uh, invade uh, uh, Chesapeake Bay. They're able to um, uh, capture Washington and achieve the dream of every modern American that's burning Washington, D.C. to the ground. Uh, they spare private residences. Um, they uh, uh, spare the patent office, oddly enough. Uh, but if you were to go to Washington, D.C., uh, there are still scorch marks from the original fire at the bottom of the White House. So if you want to see it, just jump over the fence and run as fast as you can to the White House. Probably not a good idea. Uh, they, they get there so quickly that um, they actually eat the meal that President James Madison was going to have. Uh, and the Federalists will later say little Jimmy Madison had to go run off in the middle of the night. Uh, Dolly Madison saves a lot of the uh, uh, sort of... Um, the priceless treasures of the White House, including the famous picture of George Washington. Uh, interestingly enough, the fire would have been a lot worse, but that night a hurricane strong storm hit the Chesapeake area, which really slowed down the British and put out the fires. Uh, and then there was also a tornado that went through the area. Amazing. Well, the British keep their move on up toward Baltimore. Now, Baltimore is going to be a different story. Uh, American forces with about 13,000 men, mainly militia, had fortified on the heights behind the city. About 1,000 men held Fort McHenry, an island in the harbor. Uh, the British had landed at a place called North Point, uh, where a group of American militiamen actually inflicted severe casualties. Uh, and when the British finally got inside the city, uh, they saw American defenses. And they go, whoa, we're not going to do that. Uh, so they thought the best way was to go into the harbor and invade. Well, unfortunately, you've got to get past Fort McHenry. And I think we all know this story here. Uh, they stopped bombarding um, Fort McHenry all through the night. Um, and one of the people who was watching this was a lawyer uh, by the name of Francis Scott Key. Um, he had been there trying to get prisoners released. And they said, we're sorry we can't let you go until after this battle. And so he watches this all night bombardment. And then in the morning, he sees that the flag is still there uh, and the British have to withdraw. This because, this because, is because a word? It is now. This of course is uh, the inspiration for the poem that he writes, the Star Spangled Banner, which is a poem later set to the tune of an old English drinking song. So if you ever wonder why the Star Spangled Banner is so difficult to sing, I think you have to go to an English pub and have several pints of ale to do it. You know, I, I know I shouldn't be recording this, but I just don't like the Star Spangled Banner as a national anthem. I would prefer America the Beautiful, but I, I'm not in charge of those things. Well, the last plan for the British was to uh, invade uh, through New Orleans. Now, the British decide that they're going to uh, invade New Orleans and defending New Orleans is uh, Andrew Jackson. He'd been showing up the defenses of Mobile and New Orleans. Uh, and so the British are led by this guy named Sir Edmund Packenham, which is a terrible name. And he decided that he would uh, directly assault American forces. So um, he takes his army and he marches slowly over wide open fields um, toward the American lines. Jackson with his array, array of frontier militiamen, Creole aristocrats, 
free blacks, pirates, including Sean Lafitte, um, were re ready and waiting. And when the morning fog uh, lifted, they ran down a murderous rain of artillery and bullet shells, deadly rifle fire uh, upon the British. When the British withdrew, uh, 2,000 had been killed or wounded, including Edward Packenham. Uh, Packenham, they found his body. Uh, they pickled his body uh, in a barrel of rum. Um, and that wasn't to be insulting, was that he was a well-known officer to the Americans. And by pickling his body in a barrel of rum, that means that he could be sent back to England to uh, be properly buried because Packenham would have been one of the heroes in the Napoleonic Wars as well. Well, the war ends, oddly enough, two weeks before the Battle of New Orleans, but they didn't have TV, they didn't have internet, and they didn't have telegram. Uh, the war ended uh, two weeks earlier, no one had told them, so all that slaughter was for uh, naught, strangely enough. Um, it ended with the uh, Treaty of Ghent. Um, and what the Treaty of Ghent was, it was the, the terms of the treaty was pretty much what they call status quo antebellum. Uh, and pretty much they're saying it's tie. Status quo meant antebellum, of course, anti means before, bellum means war. Status quo means everything stays the same before the war. Um, but there's one little uh, drama that has to play out, and this deals with the Federalists. The Federalists who were based in New England uh, really hated Mr. Madison's war or little Jimmy's war. Uh, and so they met in Hartford, Connecticut with the so-called Hartford Convention, uh, Convention. And what they decided to do was that they wanted to go down to Washington, D.C. and demand that uh, uh, we get out of this war, uh, that this war is a mistake uh, and it's... Um, uh, we think we need to be out of it. Well, when they get to Washington, D.C., everybody's celebrating because the war's over and it's being treated as an American victory. And when word of the Hartford Convention comes out, it's the death knell of the Federalist Party. I mean, they'd already lost uh, Hamilton uh, and now it's making the, the, the Federalists look disloyal, treasonous, stupid, you name it, all at one time. And so the Federalists will cease being a really uh, active party. 1816, they'll run their last Federalist candidate uh, in um, uh, uh, Rufus King. Rufus King? Man, that's a terrible presidential name. So what's the impact of the war? Uh, well, it's sometimes referred to as uh, the Second War of Independence. Uh, that f for the first time, really, people are going to really start thinking of themselves uh, as Americans as, as opposed to people from their particular states. Uh, they felt like that they, they had gone toe to toe uh, with the British and survived it all. Some other things that it did was uh, it created some new heroes for the Americans. William Henry Harrison, Andrew Jackson, two future presidents. Um, school kids uh, were required to know the dying words of Captain James Lawrence in the Chesapeake, where he said, don't give up the ship which by the way, they, after he died, they gave up the ship. But anyway, famous words that really inspired a lot of Americans. The, the, the war also revealed that, um, that we need a better internal transportation system, roads, bridges, canals to move men and materiel. Uh, and it launched us into a war of economic independence because they had not been able to produce goods all during the war. And so a homegrown manufacturing industry uh, had, had grown up. So this led to the birth of uh, manufacturing. Uh, and then one of the strangest results of the War of 1812 was a reversal of the Republic, Democratic Republicans. Uh, they became what we call federalized. Um, in other words, they said, look, you know what? Maybe we need a peacetime army and maybe a peacetime Navy. Uh, wasn't so bad after all. I mean, a small army, a bigger Navy because the Navy can't really inflict damage on the people. They also saw the value of a national bank. They saw the, uh, the value of having a, a protective terrorist to protect American industries. Um, they also, you know, they, they took a lot of these nationalist measures um, and they, they sort of threw away the idea of states' rights and strict construction. Uh, now this takes up Madison's two terms 
And that's going to lead us to what we call the era of good feelings uh, from 1816 to uh, 1824, uh, which I of course will uh, 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 take, uh, take up in our next lecture. Okay.